how to get forensic value out of video surveillance is something that sounds like it would be an obvious thing, but it's not, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so there's a lot of problems with existing video surveillance systems. Now I want to put this into more context for you. A video surveillance system can be a moving vehicle, it can be a city, it can be a building, it can be a lot of different you know, pieces of architecture. I don't want to necessarily narrow your focus to just, you know, oh, a building that has cameras, right? This is, you know, surveillance systems can be small, medium, and large, and they can do a lot of different things. So, but still today, uh, if we were seeing with consistency on the news, high quality forensic evidence of a, bro a robbery or, or anything else that happens that makes it to the news, then maybe I wouldn't need to be here. <laughs> but unfortunately, the reality is with major consistency on national and local news, we're seeing forensic evidence of crimes that have very little forensic value at all. And some of the reasons for that are, there, some of them are low resolution, still on analog coaxial cable. Uh, others uh, uh, are, are completely unaware. And there's still a major problem with this industry of incompatibility with systems. There is no one size fits all uh, from servers to analytics to uh, cameras to lenses. You have to still make a list of compatibility. And then, unfortunately, you still have to vet that compatibility with manufacturers and sometimes even third party uh, individuals that have experience in testing. Um, and also, cameras, unfortunately, are insecure. That's a reality. <laughs> Yesterday, the US government officially passed a bill banning some of the, lar the largest surveillance camera manufacturer in the world from government operation uh, in the United States. And the reason for that is because this has been going on for years. This is not a new thing. This is now headlined in, in major news, so now people are realizing it. But there's been infiltration in cyber attacks and even built-in phone home algorithms to Chinese-made technology that is in police departments, government agencies, and commercial facilities all across the United States. There's actually vulnerability testing that you can do right now to identify if one of those brands, and the worst part about that is that they could masquerade as a different brand. So the brand that was in fact banned has dozens and dozens of other brands all across the country that are local domestic companies that may or may not know the, the reality of the situation. And some of them are also the same brand that's on your home refrigerator or microwave. It's a, it's a compounded situation that's escalated over time. And then in addition to that, they have blind spots still. How often is a camera pointing to the right? And Murphy's Law happens, something happened on the left, just a little bit to the left of it. So, that's kind of the basics of what we're going to cover today, as well as what are some newer technologies that you can use that can reduce your investigation time, improve your forensic value. Um, so this is a simple image here. I mean, this is wide dynamic range. So wide dynamic range is an algorithm that's coded onto the sensor directly that's built into the camera. So you can, there's many different filtering that you can do that block out uh, different, you know, different kinds of light from sunlight as the sun is setting or the sun is rising. It has a peak time which can cause shadowing on moving targets or headlights can interrupt um, different uh, fluidity of, of, of detail. So applying a, a camera that has ultra wide dynamic range and look for a number on the spec sheet. I'm a spec sheet guy. I actually read it and vet it and, and look at it. If you don't have a camera that's at least 120 dB rated, I would, I would go to the next in line. So that's, a, that's kind of the minimum standard of wide dynamic range that you should have on your surveillance cameras. So here's a perfect example where the sun is, is setting or this could be really early in the morning and on the left the algorithm's turned off and we're not seeing you know, identifiable feature sets and on the right, very clear. 
another major component to this overall equation, and this is a formula. <laughs> it's from algorithms, it's to sensors, it's from hard drives, it's to you know, pixels per foot, it's to compression, it's to video management software, and it's also to frames per second. That's how many frames an entire video is seeing. So most televisions were not even seeing real time necessarily, which is kind of 30 frames per second as a standard. It's actually more closer to 26 frames per second. So what you're looking at, I want to look at your, you really focus on this, and I've isolated this intentionally so that you can't compare, because when you can compare, then it makes it easier. If you're only seeing one thing, then you can make a judgment and actually decide, hey, that's not too bad. I can follow the red guy, the guy with the long hair and the red shirt. I could kind of see him moving. Well, now let's bump it up to five frames per second. And you can convince yourself that if you only see this, that maybe that's enough. But these people are moving very slow. They're going downstairs. This is a very, like, what is this? A gener generously 20 by 20 foot area. So this is a pretty small environment that we're seeing, right? So it's very focused in. Uh, and are they moving quickly? You know, when crimes or situations happen and there's abrupt movement and you have a low frame rate with a low exposure, what's going to happen is those people are going to turn to ghosts. If someone accelerates quickly, they may look fine at a general pace or a slower pace, but if they abruptly enhance their pace, they're going to be ghosted. It's called a ghosting effect in surveillance, and that's cumulative to the frames per second, the algorithms, and the lighting. It has a lot to do with uh, uh, many different things. So this is 10, 10 frames per second. You know, we're seeing uh, a, a double, double the improvement, significant, you know, movement, a lot of fluidity here. And maybe if I would have showed you this first and hid the number, do you think you would have said, hey, that's real time, if you're honest with yourself? The reality is, unless you are a forensic expert looking at video surveillance all day and all night, knowing the difference between, between 10 or 15 frames per second and comparing that to real time, you, the human eye, unless really finely tuned, will not notice the difference, okay? And even at real time with 30 frames per second, that's sometimes not enough. If you have a vehicle that's moving fast and your intention for that camera is to actually capture a license plate with the correct lighting, the correct real estate, the laning, it's actually recommended that you exceed 30 frames per second and actually get it closer to 60 frames per second. Because uh, for a slower moving vehicle, you could maybe get away with free, you know, 15 frames per second. Like maybe an entrance to a parking lot where there's you know, uh, you know, forced bumps that make the car slow down. 15 frames per second can execute quality images at slower moving targets. Um, but if it's a faster moving target, sometimes 30 frames per second isn't even enough. So I, that's why I didn't show all of this at first. Breaking this down, it, it makes it look a little easy. But if you individually show the differences, you know, positives and negatives between every frame rate, um, it, it makes sense. Now, one other thing, that if you have a big system, there's some applications that you can get away with three or five frames per second. There's other applications that you might need 60 frames per second. But every camera, just like every position on a football team, needs to have a specific job detail, okay? And it has a specific role. And you need to calibrate those roles uh, with, with uh, the formula. And the other thing is, if your designer just blanketly, and I see this all the time, says, okay, your cameras are set to 15 frames per second. Well, 15 frames per second, motion activity or no motion activity, plus if you're talking about four or five megapixel cameras or HD cameras and you're talking about 100 cameras, that equates to money, as in storage, as in retention time, okay? So configuring every camera for every application for its intended use is key. Um, here's just a kind of an overview. So 30 frames per second. I always tell people this, if, if someone's walking down a hall, um, 
here's the, here's the idea. Like it take, let's say it takes them their slow walker, 10 seconds to walk down from one end of the hallway to the other end of the hallway. You have a camera on one end. So do you need 300 pictures of that person walking down the hallway? Probably not, right? So unless it's a situation where the speed could change, but you know, 10 frames per second could probably do that job. One frame per second, you could have a probability of missing them all together. So now we're gonna get into resolution. Uh, this is also part of the value situation. This is part of the formula, frames per second, resolution, compression, all these different elements. So 200 pixels per foot, incredible resolution. We have a domestic plate, ba even based in Illinois, and a foreign you know, uh, overseas plate that has larger characters. And then we have a man and a woman. So um, that's really good pixel density. Uh, going down 150 frames, uh, 150 pixels per foot, most people wouldn't be able to, again, see the meaningful difference, but if we start going down to 50 feet, we compare 50 to 100 and I, or 200, and I really want you to train your eyes to compare and contrast a little bit because too often in this industry, we accept low-quality video because we're used to it. If you look at Hollywood, whenever they put video surveillance and security into context, they put by design, lines going through it to kind of dumb it down so people think, oh, this is video surveillance. This isn't my iPhone video or a video on YouTube. They actually dumb it down a little bit and throw lines through it or, and then maybe they do some magic if it's forensics. But you know, that's what Hollywood does because that's a reality is our, you know, people in security are trained to accept low resolution images and that doesn't have to be the case. So uh, comparing all these things are pretty important, even down to 20 frames per second. There's applications where 20 pixels per foot is more than fine. Here's one of those examples. If you have a camera mounted you know, 40 feet up and you're trying to kind of see an overview of a parking lot, lots of cars, lots of people moving, you know, the reality of you being able to have 200 pixels per foot to cover that amount of geography is probably not realistic, okay? So when we're, when we're talking about 200 pixels per foot or 20, that's the zoomed in section of the image. That's when you're doing your forensic investigation, you found the bad guy, you're zooming into him. What do you want to have, you know, for your forensic audit? And, and sometimes just seeing a red pickup truck or a white SUV is enough to have general overview, which could articulate to 20 pixels per foot. Other times you need to have forensic detail that really you, you can't settle for much, much more or much less than 100. So here's a simple example. You know, we have a building, the camera's mounted uh, 20 feet up in the air. Obviously this is an emulation and we have an entryway, maybe that entryway is 15 feet, but it's really intended for entrances and exits of vehicles. Now, some camera resolutions, once you zoom into that area, could be 20 pixels per foot. The other is 100, right? The other application here is, does this have an optically zoomed lens? Do you want this to capture more than just that specific plate? Do you wanna capture the context around that entrance? How many people were in the car? Were, there's, were there more vehicles? Did someone get out of the car? Because you, you can have more context, more field of view, and still get 100 pixels per foot in the targeted area that you have. I have a question coming up for all of you. So I want you to just take a little look at this. Okay, here we have our, our fellow. He's probably a door-to-door -door salesman, whatever he is. And we have a camera on top of our building. What could possibly be wrong here? camera placement. That is it. So I gave that example previously by design. If you want a camera to kind of survey situational awareness in a parking structure or a general view, understand that you're not going to necessarily have forensic detail. You're going to get situational views like maybe it was a man, maybe it was a woman, that man had a white shirt on versus a red shirt, okay? Now the camera is too high. The camera, so if he gets closer to the building, what are we gonna see? Top of heads. 
And so this was an entrance of a building, and I've redacted kind of who this is, but this was taken July 13th. I mean, I'm, you know, on Facebook, I'm following the local departments and, 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 other, and other agencies, and so we're, 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 we're trying to identify a burglary. Now, of course, there's other elements that go into an investigation other than surveillance footage. I completely understand that, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But if this camera was intended to capture identifiable information at the front entrance of this establishment, not, not going to work. We're going to see the tops of heads, and this is also at low light, so it's another compounding thing. So we kind of see a profile as, we're, as he's scrunched down, and obviously we see something in his, in his hands. We can tell that he has maybe burgundy or red shoes. He's a, he's a male. I can maybe guess it at ethnicity, but uh, outside of that, you know, we're not getting a whole lot. That, that's, a, that's a pretty big volume of individuals out there. So just to put this into clear context here, camera placement really matters and it falls into your objective, right? So eight feet high, 20 feet high, situational awareness, forensic detail, okay? Now, obviously there's a concern if you mount a camera lower that something could happen to that camera, right? You could have vandalism. Most cameras today come standard with IK10 rated. And I actually had a really great experience. For a month, I was able to work with the company that actually certifies uh, this vandal resistant rating, which is IK10. Basically what they do is they put the camera in a little elevator shaft and they take a bowling ball and drop it on it at different heights to measure impact ratings, okay? Uh, and so, if you can see, if the camera's properly installed from the infrastructure to the housing, you, you know, there could be applications which would justify a lower to the ground camera. Um, but, you know, that's an individual situation judgment call. So, this is one of the main things I really, really, really want you to walk away with, um, is making good buying decisions. <laughs> and one of those is starting with the open platform first. I've seen so many challenges and mistakes because that introductory component where everything is being connected to, if you make, make a wrong step, A, you could be locked into a situation. It's kind of like anyone who's ever you know, have a, had a foreign vehicle, right? If something small breaks with the vehicle, those smaller components cost an arm and a leg, okay? So there's that challenge with not having an open platform solution. The other challenge is it really reduces your capacity to evolve your system over time. We all know how fast technology is changing. It's changing all the time from software to hardware. And open platform systems can allow you to adapt with the times and really legitimize your initial investment and maximize it. So let's talk about that a little bit. So you can have compatibility, right? So sometimes there's going to be fire alarm, burglar alarm systems that need to interact with the system. Other times there's going to be mass notification solutions. Obviously video surveillance is one of them. Uh, door, electronic access control, major component. So many in this industry. Another major meaningful problem is that video surveillance is over here, access control is over here, and you have to train this guy to work that system, that guy to work this system, all the time. They don't work with each other, which could make your investigation time more fluid. Uh, you have different training, you have different compatibilities as well, when you should be able to have credentials tied into the video surveillance image directly. Not if you don't have an open platform video management software, you can't do that. So, and also business intelligence, which I believe is one of the, the, the founding things in the next 10 years that we're going to see, is the ability to turn some of this security technology into actionable business insights. And I'm actually going to be showing you that you know, at the very end here, is how deep learning algorithms can really not only improve your for forensics time, but actually allow you to manage your staff, your people, and, and potentially even your cities. So, 
Let's do a little quick checklist of an open platform system. Supports a high volume of surveillance cameras, brands. So all the different camera brands out there, do they support them? Uh, furthermore, do they have a specific API integration? A lot of the salespeople in the booth say, hey, do you support this camera? Yep, that's on our list. But ask a follow-up question. Is there a direct API integration? Most of them won't know, and they'll have to get back to you <laughs> because most salespeople don't know that. But that's a really important question. An API are all of the tools that the camera can do. Can the camera do motion detection? Can the camera change its wide dynamic range, which I showed you? Can the cha camera change its frame rate? Can the ch does the camera self-store video on it? Does the camera do intelligent video features? If a direct API integration is not done, you're getting a dumb stream of video to your VMS, and you can't really do anything that the, cam the camera that you paid for uh, features. So ask those follow-up questions. And Onviv Profile S, the open standard for streaming video. If they don't have that, they're really not a VMS that's worth choosing. Um, does not require hardware. I think this is a big one, and there's a lot of people that actually disagree with me <laughs> on this topic. Here's my argument. Video management software companies are very, very good at writing software. How many companies can we think of that are masterful at hardware and masterful at hardware? Very, very few. In fact, I could probably only think of maybe one or two ever. The other comparison is usually a person that can fix your vehicle and paint the Mona Lisa isn't the same individual. It's a different skill set, right? So if a software company is pushing hardware on you, there's something wrong. So the other reason for that is you want to have best-in-breed hardware that if a drive fails, the system doesn't crash, and there's no dependency on either one, right? You have your software that has your firmware updates and your patches, and then you have your hardware where you can probably get, if you guys are working with your IT administrators, probably get a really good deal from HP or Dell and you can get a much more souped up powerful system at a reduced cost that's not proprietary and locked into the software platform okay obviously every software company is going to give you minimum requirements like these are the minimum requirements so that our software can function well uh, but if they try to lump it together or force you to buy a turnkey DVR walk the other way uh, integrates with third-party analytics, access control. I kind of already talked about that. Strong channel. This is why this is really meaningful. So a channel means more than just salespeople. Okay? A channel means a supply chain of parts, components, and support. Okay? If a company that you're investing in does not have a really quality channel, both regionally and domestically and internationally, there might, be a, there might be something wrong with that, okay? You want to invest in a software platform that can last you 10 years plus. And one of the key decisions in that is the person that I actually buy that from, the consultant or the system integrator or whoever it is, there needs to be more than just them locally that can support this. You need to think about year four, year five. And if there is not multiple different partners that are certified in this technology, you probably want to consider other candidates. Um, lastly, history of updates, okay? History of updates, look at their records. Most websites should show you how often do they come up with an update? How, off, how proactive are they on fixing bugs? How innovative are they in integrating new technologies into the platform? This is a key indicator of how much resources in R&D the company is investing in continuing to innovate and to continuing to make their products solid and stable. This isn't the consumer electronics business we're talking about, okay? This isn't like a, a, a DIY camera that we're putting at our front door. This, I, I, this is an enterprise commercial and government solution that needs to have a track record of support and updates. Uh, camera options and design considerations. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on this because this could easily be its own talk track, okay? I'm going to give you 
macro views on this, and that's about it. And if you have more questions, please come, after, come and talk to me afterwards. So there's two types of cameras. There's directional and omnidirectional. A directional is something that's looking at a very specific target. An omnidirectional is something that's looking at a very wide target. Okay, so you know, when your system is designed, it, can, it should use a healthy mix of both. You shouldn't have a major one, one or the other, right? Too many directional cameras, maybe you're missing something and not having enough situational awareness. Too much situational awareness, you might not have enough forensic detail. So some applications for directional, obviously entrances and exits, maybe down hallways, and any kind of critical, critical pieces of information, okay? Maybe a booking room. Um, uh, maybe a, what's really actually starting, we're, we're starting to see a lot of uh, uh, items in, in police departments is actually um, Craigslist parking spaces uh, actually isolated and designed for the police department. We actually uh, are designing uh, forensic detail cameras that monitor uh, these internet trading parking spots that are designated by local law enforcement. Uh, omnidirectional cameras, exterior of buildings, parking lots, lobbies, intersections, Anything where instead of putting multiple cameras, you can put one camera, one cable, one software license, too. Here's a nice example, like a healthy mix of 180 degree, forensic detail, directional and omnidirectional. Now, there, there is another type of camera. It's an optically zoomed pan tilt zoom camera. Most people, when they think 360, they think of this, right? It's a camera that has a motor that can zoom in, zoom out, Pan left, pan right. Um, those are okay in certain applications. Ten years ago, they were kind of the de facto standard. Um, you would mount a PTZ on top of your building and actually think you're secure when it's actually on a pre-programmed guard tour, changing position every five or ten seconds to see a very small piece of, of the overall view. All right. Now, those are tending towards panoramic cameras. But... Optical zoom cameras still have their place, and here's the main reason why. If uh, you have a camera and the, the, the installation getting connection or cable or wireless or whatever infrastructure you're using to communicate data to that camera is challenging, but you need to see very far away, <laughs> use an optical zoom camera because you're looking at something very specific and something very far away. Um, so panoramic cameras, there's a lot of decisions. There's a lot of additional choices. Uh, another thing, I designed one of the algorithms that I'll show you in a second here, but now there's two breeds of cameras uh, that, that are out there on the market. Um, there is single sensor or fisheye cameras that um, you know, see a 360 degree view, or there's multi-sensor cameras. It's a camera that has multiple directional sensors inside of them. So here's a little quick video of seeing the multi-sensor. So this is 180 degrees, right? Some, some of these cameras can be moved inside the, the housing to look at different directions, it's like a 360 degree view. There's even some of these multi-sensors that can have different focal lengths. So if you want to get forensic detail out of one of your sensors in your multi-sensor camera, you can have a different focal length. That can be isolated to the entrance. The other three cameras can see the overview. But not all manufacturers do that. <laughs> now, it's, it's a little different. Not all manufacturers allow that. Some force them to be locked in, whatever the mechanical design of the camera. So this is another place to vet. So this is uh, an image of a 360 degree camera. A really good application is indoors, heavy traffic areas, because we could have easily put one, two, three, four, or more cameras in this environment but, but here, we can uh, see it all directions. Now, most people don't love looking at the fisheye view, so you want to pick a fisheye camera that has backwards compatibility to the video management system that allows for correction of the camera. All right, so if it only does in-camera dewarping, you're limited to your field of view. What you should be able to do with this technology is pan, tilt, and zoom every single angle in all directions in recorded video. So if something happened on the left, you can, and it's within the coverage of your fisheye image, 
you should be able to correct that view and position right to it. Okay? So server-side or client-side dewarping is a very key ingredient when checking out fisheye surveillance 360-degree cameras. So this is an area most people in this room probably know this better than me. <laughs> and so I would love for you to call me out if I'm missing anything or add value to this part of the uh, section. So I am, I am not in law enforcement. I have been in you know, private business in the tech community for a very long time. Um, but it had an opportunity to work with a lot of law enforcement. So to be really honest with you, between watching my crime movies and talking with you guys, this is what I came up with for our uh, pre-investigation checklist, right? You need to identify time. You need to identify location, direction. Where did the person or suspect or individuals come from? Where did they exit? Uh, what is their age? What is their gender? What kind of distinguishing clothes did they wear? What is their ethnicity? What kind of accessories? Were they on a bike? Did they wear a hat? Did they have a bag? Were they holding a television set at two in the morning walking out of a, a business? What are these other kind of accessory characteristics? Here's the reality though. A lot of times we couldn't necessarily tell what the gender was. It was questionable what the age range was. We didn't see any accessories or much more than that. And honestly, we, didn't, we knew an approximate time, but we weren't really precise in that time. So how often does it happen when you're really left with maybe a location and maybe the guy had on a red shirt? Does that happen a lot? So the, one of the, that's a big problem. One of the other big problems when you kind of get to the point of reviewing video surveillance and, and forensics is it's really boring. <laughs> you have to search hours and hours. Even if you think you have that one camera where he may have passed or she may have passed by, man, there's so much you have to go through and, and, and to find it, even if their camera was recorded on motion activity. So, you know, here's a general overview. Now, I actually created this emulation myself just to kind of, you know, in very simple terms, show you what some of the options are for smart search, okay? Smart search is a feature by which you actually can specifically look for areas and time quickly. Um, so basically what happens is you highlight the frame, okay? You isolate the area. Maybe this is where a baggage was left. Maybe this is where the first punch took place because we did get our location. Instead of reviewing this whole frame, we, we can actually isolate it so that it's actually specifically in this area. And I know, you know, as we're going to see, they have to all go through that area. But the idea here is that we're isolating specifics of areas so that we can bring the video that we need in a thumbnail version quickly instead of just playing the tape through and hoping you were awake enough to actually catch that person or what you're looking for. You're getting a thumbnail, a five second thumbnail here, here, here. You check all of the applications of what happened in that area between the hours of four and 8 p.m., okay? So here is it, here's it working in like a video management kind of uh, platform. So you pick your camera, you pick your date, you pick your time, and you can isolate um, the area that you're looking for. So you're drawing your line in the frame here. That's kind of where the first punch happened or that's where someone slipped and fell. And then instantaneously, boom, you have all of these different evident pieces of evidence that articulate motion activity within your date, your time parameters, and your location. So it really helps to narrow things down. Um, also, this is a major feature of open platform solutions that is really standard. Like this is, honestly, this isn't anything too cool. <laughs> this is something that you should have. In 2018, this is a kind of de facto standard of searching video. This is the easy part. Now let's show you the cool part. So we're taking all of these different areas, all of these elements and from location, and we're taking, these are filtering, whatever we can or we cannot. We're putting these into a database, okay? And we're trying to compile more information with different filters. And um, here, 
is one of those images, okay? Notice the time tagged to every moving thing. What you're seeing here is eight hours of video. So actually, this one is a little bit more. This is a little bit less. This is 30 minutes of video, okay? And this is 53 seconds. I think I got my numbers a little off there. But 30 minutes of video in 53 seconds. Every moving object is tagged at a specific time, at a specific place, and you can see everything instead of watching 30 minutes of video. Or if you have a much more wider time frame, this is something that you can use. What's really neat about this you could, it, it, there is a chance that, I don't know what system you have now, that you can actually get this to work with all of your existing cameras and existing systems today. That's right, and it can be an analog camera, it can be an IP camera, it can be an embedded DVR. You can actually get this technology to work on any existing camera. This can be a, a street corner camera. This can be a camera in a police vehicle, okay? so. Let's apply some more filters to this. Now we were able to see that, that right there in and of itself is pretty neat, is that you can review all the activity, but we want to see the people with the red apparel. You apply your filter and boom, red bikes, red shirts, red pants. Now we can apply this to traffic. And again, we're going to apply a filter and I only want to look at the red vehicles or blue vehicles. Let's look at blue vehicles. What if I just want to look at a very specific lane? We can do that too. One lane. Now you, you can look at motorcycles as well, but let's apply something specific. Only a green motorcycle. That's pretty valuable. 10 years ago, this was barely working and really, really expensive. <laughs> I've actually met some of the founders of this company. Uh, they were my tech, not in my former company, they were one of my key technology partners that we, we worked with them on in designing them. Now, it works really, really well. Just for this, and, and I haven't even shown you the business intelligence section yet, but it's actually much more cost effective. Like, you would probably be a little surprised at what it costs per license, per camera today. And I just think the compounding value. What, hap what, would, what did you have to do on a stakeout? Like, you had a, maybe this is a street where there's some activity. You would have to sit there for hours or days and write down with a pen and paper who went into what house, what were they wearing, what time. Instead, you can go to directions. You can review footage of an entire week and say, I want to know where everyone went down a street. Now, if hundreds of people went to one door, what do you think that is? Is that a normal house? Or if you know, cars, you can manage this to actually apply better traffic process and patterns you can find out where vehicles are trending to drive to, where individual uh, you know, you know, people on foot are walking to. You can plan events around this. You can plan cities around this. You can even plan manpower around this. So if you are monitoring your cameras, you can even see where peak activities are of vehicles, of pedestrians. You can geographically apply your team, your fleet to the specific area based on heuristics, based on actual facts. Instead of, yeah, a couple months ago we got a lot of calls in this part of town. We're going to ramp up areas here. You can look at data now. You can now plan actual forensic investigations and actionable insights based on data. So all I have. I really appreciate you and I would love to uh, answer any questions that you have for me and I'm going to be here both, both two days. I have a booth at 905 uh, with Umbrella Technologies and 
You guys were really, like, no one was looking at their phone. It was amazing, and I really appreciate all of you. Thank you.